Hi, Madeline here from Sonic Bloom. Aben Life 12.2 was finally released, and so far, the focus on what features and improvements there are in the update has mostly been on the big things, like the improved auto filter, raw, melt, resonators, and the spectral audio effects. But there are also a lot of small improvements and changes that while small and maybe easily overlooked, they can make a huge difference in your workflow. And so I thought we're going to look at 12 of the small improvements that can make a big difference for you. Let's start with the first one, and that is side chaining. So to make it easier to see when you can side chain or have a MIDI input that has actually been visually changed. And you can see here in the new and improved auto filter, you have this side chain toggle that you can open up. It also says side chain. And when I turn it on, you can see a yellow dot indicating that it's set. So even when it's closed, you can see, oh yeah, it's got side chaining set up. You also have side chain listen always there as well. So that's easy. And that is very useful, especially for beginners to see like, oh, there's a side chaining option in the, in the effect. So the other devices that are affected by this are the compressor. We also have something like this in Corpus, but instead of side chaining, it's actually having a MIDI input that you can set so that basically the pitches can affect the audio effect and thus the sound. And it has the same indicator if that MIDI input is on or not. Then in Gate, we have side chain as well, as well as a glue compressor and in the multiband dynamics. And then in Shifter, we've got the MIDI input as well. Another new thing that I find is particularly helpful for beginners or intermediate users is that the context menu for all devices enabled in Live are now accessible through a button. So you can see this button here with the three dots and you can just click on it and now you have access to all the context menu options directly. So instead of having to do a right click or option click on Mac, users might maybe hopefully click on this and go like, oh, look, I can do this here. Say if this is a default preset, for example, or turn on high quality. And so this is the case, as you can see, in all devices and not just all the effects either. This next feature is something that should have been included for a long time already, and that is the ability to use program changes to switch between VST3 plugin presets. So here I've got contact and I've got an instrument bank with four different presets and they all play the same clip. But the difference is that here, in the same window where you can set the follow actions, I've set it to bank one, sub one, and then program change one, and the next one to two in program, and then three, and then four. You can also see that it's switching here. This next new feature improvement is something that I've wanted for a very long time, and that is that you're now able to specify a minimum and maximum value for parameters like types or modes. So basically anything that is a, in a drop down menu and is MIDI or macro mappable. I'm just going to quickly show you what I mean by that. So something where I've always wanted that was in the arpeggiator. And so I'm going to quickly macro map that. So first we're going to make a rack out of that with Command G or Control G on Windows. Let's turn on the macros here. And so the style, for example, has, you know, has got a quite a list of things, of patterns. And so if I just do a right click and map it to macro one, for example, before all you could do is just have like have it from random actually starts at the bottom in this one and then goes all the way to up, but you'd never limit what styles you wanted. So now if I go into the macro mapping mode, you can see here before you had nothing turn up here, but now you've got a minimum maximum. So we could, for example, say we're going to go to all the way up here. And so now 
you can see it's limited. And that works for anything that's midi mappable. So if I go into a macro mapping mode, for example, we've got groove that is the same kind of drop down or scale. Let's let's try scale and macro map that. And you can see that you've got a list. And so for example, I could go like okay from chromatic. I could just go from major to minor. So I could really limit that, which is really really cool for sound design and also for live performance. Also new is that when you use the uh, MIDI tools, so the generators or transformations, there is actually an indicator shown in the status bar which MIDI tools have been applied and in what order. So I'm just going to quickly do that. Let's go, let's just go with C to generate and then we're going to go and arpeggiate this and then Let's click on connect, transform this. So here you can see now we've done first seat, arpeggiate and connect. Another new feature that me and probably a lot of people have been waiting for for a long time is the ability to select multiple notes that are within the MIDI clip, but not necessarily one after the other. So to actually illustrate that and how it works, you have to press shift and then you can select one and then you can click and drag or just select more. And so as you can see, I can just completely jump within the MIDI clip to select MIDI notes that I want to apply changes to, for example, with uh, MIDI transformations or other options of how I can change MIDI notes, for example, with the pitch and time utilities here. Very happy about this finally being part of Live 12. So another new feature that is vitally important for anyone who is visually impaired and wants to do automation and modulation properly as well is the new keyboard workflow for automation and modulation that works both in the clip view, so in session view for both automation and modulation and in the clip view for modulation in the arrangement view and automation in the arrangement view as well. I'm just going to show you automation in the clip view as an example. So the first thing you have to do is you're going to have to click somewhere within the clip. You can basically use the left and right arrow keys to navigate. That in itself is not new. But now if I press enter, you can select the breakpoint with that. You can see it's actually kind of pulsing in white. And so now I can move it left and right or also up and down or if you want to have a specific value that the breakpoint should have you can just simply start typing as well if you mistyped you can press escape now and then it'll return to the previous value or you can press enter again to have the new value set and this way if you press enter another time you have also deselected the breakpoint and now you can basically navigate left and right again if you realize you do not want a breakpoint, you can navigate to it with left and right and then press delete or backspace on Mac to get rid of it. You can also press enter somewhere where there is not a breakpoint yet to create one. So, and if you want to cycle through automated parameters within this clip, then what you can do is you can press Alt on Windows option on Mac and use the up and down arrow keys to cycle through them. So in this clip, I have two automated parameters. So if I press the down arrow key again, you can see it's gone back to the filter cutoff. So it's always cycling through. And if you want to be able to access with this workflow, the parameters that are not automated as well, you can use Shift and Alt or Option and it'll cycle through all the parameters. Let me just go back. And basically, if you cycle through all the automation parameters that are available, you will end up with the modulation parameters as well. As you can see by the curve or dotted line in this case being blue instead of red. There's also been an interesting change for scene follow actions that you might want to know about and also use. And so let's do a double click on this first and only scene where I have clips and turn on follow actions. And you already can see here you've got longest and then it says one time eight bars. So what this means is that it basically shows you the length of the longest clip. So basically the clips would loop and then the follow action would happen in this case after eight bars because you've got the multiplier of one. 
and by default it sets to next and I'm just going to keep it like this for this example. If you want to learn more about follow actions, I'm going to link my tutorial about this. And if I have a clip that is not looped, so I'm going to go into this one that is the longest, then here you can see it'll show you clip end instead and then it will jump to the next scene. But there's also the other option of unlinked. That's something we already know from follow action and also automation or modulation in clips. And so here we could set it to whatever length we want. So for example, if you wanted to jump already to the next scene after four bars, we can do that by just adding four bars or even, you know, shorter amounts by setting beats or 16th notes. Improvements have also been made when it comes to take lanes. So if you have recorded at least two takes on a track, then this dedicated button appears that lets you unfold the take lanes or hide them again when you press the button again. And it also appears if you select insert take lane through the context menu or if you use the shortcut for it, it's not visible when you are in automation mode. and it obviously also isn't visible when you fold up the track. There are also two new context menu options. So if I do a right click here on the track, you can see delete all take lanes if you want to start from scratch or delete unused take lanes, which can be really useful if you've recorded a lot of takes and there are certain takes that you used nothing in your comp. This next new feature improvement is something that a lot of people will likely appreciate, especially if they use group tracks a lot and add a lot of tracks to a group because before if you had a lot of tracks within a group the overview for the group track would get pretty large and so that can be visually cluttering and so there have been changes made so let me just take all of these tracks here group them with command g or control g on windows and then so far this doesn't look all that different although you can see that you can make it a lot smaller. And then what also is great that was added is if I have subgroups within the group, so more groups, and I'll just fold them up here. And what you see is you actually have only two displays of the clips within the tracks. So basically, if you have a subgroup, it only shows you where there are clips and where there is nothing within the subgroup combined. So that makes the uh, group track overview a lot more space saving. Also new as a feature are quick tags. So for example, if I, let's say, go into the audio effects here, currently I've got the default folder for the shifter selected. And below here you can see the tags are modulation and pitch shift. And there's also the option to add tags. So for example, I could add a tag that I have created and that I find useful to add, tag anything. And what I like about it is, first of all, you can see how presets, samples, plugins, anything are tagged or not tagged. If you select something, you realize, oh, there's no tag, then uh, you could possibly just have a quick look at it, what it is, or listen to it, and then add tags so that it'll turn up if you search for something. And so if the browser is in focus, you can actually use the shortcut Control E on Windows or Command E on Mac to jump below here so you could tag something. You can see the tags that exist already turn up. And then you can just add a tag or tags and press enter. And last but definitely not least, when you click on the library all label, then instead of showing everything unordered, all the presets are now shown as the folders that they belong in, ordered alphabetically. You can also see that the plugins and everything turn up there as well, but they come after all the devices. So basically, whether it's instrument presets or audio or media fact presets, they turn up first alphabetically, then you've got the plugins, and then you've got the Max for Life devices, and then eventually you get all the way down to samples and clips. I find that quite useful because this way, if I go up, I could just use the all label to quickly select, say, an arpeggiator and an auto filter and also, say, a drift preset 
Whereas before I had actually hidden that label, because I found it just chaotic. And the way I use search, I, I don't actually ever use all. I use the sub labels that are more specific. Well, that's it. I hope you found this useful. If you did, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Until then, bye.